Okay, so in this video, we're going to take a look at CIE 2019 paper for the IGCSE physics. And so let's get started with our longer answer questions. And um, we've got a rocket is stationary on the launch pad. At time equals zero, the rocket engines are switched on and exhaust gas gases are ejected from the nozzles of the engines. The rocket accelerates upwards, and the diagram shows how the acceleration of the rocket varies between time equals zero and time tf, whatever that is. Okay, so things I'm noticing straight away from this graph. We've got a period where the acceleration is increasing, and then we've got a period of constant acceleration. I'm going to use these for the next question. So, first of all, define acceleration. So, acceleration is the rate of change of velocity, or the change in velocity per unit time, something along those lines. On the, on the diagram, we want to sketch a graph to show how the speed of the rocket varies between time equals zero and time equals tf. So, the thing to remember with a speed time graph or a velocity time graph, acceleration is the gradient. So, before I said in this first section, that the acceleration was increasing, and then the acceleration is constant. So what that means is we should have an increasing gradient showing increasing acceleration, and then we should have a constant gradient or a straight line graph. Okay, so that's our speed time graph. Sometime later, the rocket is far from Earth. The effects of Earth's gravity on the motion of the rocket are insignificant. As the rocket accelerates, its momentum increases. Okay. So then on a complete side note, state the principle of conservation of momentum. So there are two parts to this, hence why there are two marks available for this. The first one is saying what it is. So initial total momentum is equal to final total momentum, or some other words to the same effect. Total momentum stays the same, anything like that. That's part one. So essentially, this is going to be getting you one of your marks. Second part is saying when you are allowed to apply that. So we're allowed to apply that in an isolated system or where no result, resultant external force is applied to the system. So that's why we needed this information. The effect of the Earth's gravity is insignificant. There's no longer a force acting on the rocket. So now we can apply conservation of momentum. And that's uh, going to get you your second mark in there. Explain how the principle of conservation momentum applies to the accelerating rocket and the exhaust gases. Uh, so I'm going to kind of show you a. So let's imagine we're doing this during takeoff, um, but we realistically we'd actually have to apply this when it was outside of the Earth. But the idea is the same. Let's say initially you've got a rocket and its fuel are stationary. So uh, they all have a total momentum of zero because it's just sitting there. What it then does is it fires up its engines and it starts accelerating gas particles out the bottom. So you can see I'm showing those in the diagram here. These particles are gaining momentum in the downwards direction as they are fired out the bottom of the rocket. So to conserve total momentum, that must mean the rocket must gain upwards momentum so that when you add their two momenta together, that cancels out and gives you zero total momentum. That's the idea here answer the question. So first of all, the exhaust gases experience an impulse and gain momentum downwards. Okay, so this is kind of our first point that we're trying to make. And then to keep so that's where your first your marks are available. Keep total to keep total momentum zero, the the rocket experiences an equal but opposite impulse and gains momentum upwards there. And there's your second mark um, saying that it's to keep total momentum the zero, it has to get momentum upwards to counter out the downwards momentum of the exhaust. Okay, so question two, we've got a sign that extends over road. So you've essentially got the base of your sign down here. And then this is the part that actually overhangs the road. Um, in a minute, we're going to be taking moments about this point P. So I'm just going to mark on some distances that we're going to be using. So we're going to be calculating the moment of the weight force about P. So we're going to need its distance from P, so 0.5. And we're also going to be calculating the moment of this concrete block about P. And we can see that that is two meters away. 
So those are the distances I'm going to be using in a second. So the mass of the sign is 3.4 tons. Calculate the weight. Uh, so we need to be showing how we're doing this. Um, so our first mark in this question is going to be for showing the working. So we've got our equation and the numbers substituted in. And then the second mark is for getting the correct number with a unit. It's weight, it's a force, so it should be measured in newtons. The weight of the sign acts at a horizontal distance of 1.8 meters from the center of the support post, and it produces a turning effect about point P. So you see here, we're taking moments about point P, which is I, I was measuring all the distances to the point P earlier on. Okay, so horizontal point P is a horizontal distance of 1.3 meters from the center of the support post. So all of those distances were described on the diagram anyway. Calculate the moment about P due to the weight of the sign. So again, we're going to be doing the same thing. We're going to be uh, here. So showing what equation we're using. We're showing our numbers being substituted into our equation. And we've got our correct answer with a correct unit there. The stages are the same for all calculations. What equation are you using? Show what numbers you put into your equation and then answer with unit. OK, so that's our moment of the weight. Uh, let's. So the concrete block is positioned on the other side of the support post, uh, and it's there to essentially counteract the moment of the weight force and keep it balanced. So we referred previously to the word center of mass quite a lot. So what is center of mass? It's the point where all of the mass of an object can be considered to be concentrated, and that's why we say the weight force of the object acts from that point. But that's actually what center of mass is. The weight of the concrete block produces a moment about point P that exactly cancels out the moment caused by the weight W. Calculate the weight of the, conc the concrete block. So, if it's going to cancel out the moment from the weight, its moment must also be 1.7 times 10 to the 4, but it is acting 2 metres from our pivot point P. So, in terms of our working here, we've uh, rearranged our equation in algebraic form, substitute numbers in, and then you've got your correct answer again with a unit in there. Um, so that's our process for doing our calculations here. Okay, so the concrete block is removed, the sign and the support post rotate about point P in a clockwise direction. State and explain what happens to the moment about point P due to the weight of the sign as it rotates. This is worth having a so initially, the weight had a perpendicular distance of 0.5 to this point P. Well, hopefully you can appreciate as the sign rotates, that weight force is getting further and further away from P in terms of its perpendicular distance. Okay? So that's the change that's happening. The force isn't changing, but the distance is. So the perpendicular distance between the weight force and the pivot increases, and that's going to cause a change in the moment. So the force, or this F in here, is constant, but the distance increases, so the moment of the weight increases. So in terms of actually answering this question, we were asked to state what happens to the moment. Well, we've got that at the bottom with the moment of the weight increases. That's us stating it. And we were asked to explain why, and that's what this section at the top is. This is our explaining of this, so we're saying why that happens. So a cube of side 0.04 meters is floating in a container of liquid. The diagram shows the surface of the liquid is 0.028 meters above the level of the bottom face of the cube. The pressure of the air above the cube exerts a force on the top face of the cube. The valve is closed, so you see the valve down here at the bottom right. That just means no liquid is able to escape or enter at this point. Explain in terms of air molecules how the force due to the pressure of air is produced. So we were told the force of air pressure is in the top face of the cube. So the particles collide with the top surface of the cube. And we do need to be specific about which surface they're colliding with. And the, what happens during the collision, they change direction. So that's our first marking point there. We've got collisions with the top surface of the tube and change direction. 
And actually, in the mark schemes of this one, you are uh, you are awarded one mark for this collision part here, and you are awarded another one for actually identifying that it was with the top surface. So in terms of here, this is an explain type question. So we need to be saying why that exerts a pressure. So if the air particle was changed direction, Newton's first law tells us the molecules have experienced a force because you cannot change direction without experiencing a force. So Newton's first law tells us the particles experience a force. Newton's third law tells us if the particles experience a force from the cube, the cube experiences an equal and opposite force from the particles. So let's add that in there. So actually from the particles. And if that and if that's spread over an area, we get our pressure. So we've essentially got our, our third point there telling us why there's a force. OK, so the density of the liquid in the container is 1500 kilograms per meter cubed. Calculate the pressure due to the liquid at a depth of 0 0.028. So the equation we need is this one right here. Um, we've So we've got our density, we've got our depth and we're on Earth. So we're going to put G equals 10 gives us 420 pascals. So again, there's a mark for doing the correct working. So equation and showing our numbers and another one for our correct answer with correct unit. The force on the bottom face of the cube is caused by the pressure due to the liquid, especially particles of the liquid colliding with that surface. We want to calculate what that force is. So we know what the pressure is and we know what the area is. So we rearrange our equation and then plug our numbers in. Some people forgot to square it because you were told the side of a cube is 0 0.04. So you needed to square it to get the area. And again, we've got one mark for trying correct working, one mark for correct answer with unit. The valve is opened and the liquid is pumped into the container. The surface of the liquid rises a distance of 0 0.034 meters. The cube remains floating in the liquid with its bottom face 0 0.28 below the surface of the liquid. So it's still got the same pressure acting upwards on it, essentially. Calculate the work done on the cube by the force. So work done is force times distance. We've calculated what the force is and we've just been told what the distance is. We told it right here at the top. So there's our working mark and there's our answer with correct Unit, work done is change in energy, so it's going to be measured in joules. Just one reason why this is not an efficient method of lifting up the cube. I think there are two possibilities here. Uh, you will also be doing work to increase the GP of the liquid, because the liquid uh, height is rising as well. That could be one. Or we're doing work against friction from the pipes or the sides of the container. Again, that would be wasting work. So either one of those two would be absolutely fine here. Gas of mass 0.23 grams is trapped in a cylinder by a piston. The gas is at atmospheric pressure, which is uh, 10 to the 5 pascals. Um, the piston is currently being held by a catch, which essentially stops it moving and keeps the gas volume a fixed amount. And we've got a heater in there to change its temperature. The volume is 1.9 times 10 to the minus 4, and a heater is used to increase the temperature of the trapped gas by 550 degrees C. OK, so there's some key information that we're going to be pulling out for our calculations in the next few questions there. Specific heat capacity is 0 0.72 joules per gram. So I'm picking out the fact that it says grams in there. That's going to be important because we're going to need to use the mass in grams of the gas. Calculate the energy required to increase the temperature by 550 degrees C. So the thermal energy required is mass times specific heat capacity times temperature change. We've got mass in grams because we've got specific heat capacity in joules per gram per degree C, giving us, uh, as usual, a working mark there and a mark for correct answer with unit. OK, so the power of a heater is 2.4 watts. Calculate how long it takes to supply the energy. Uh, so our equation for average power is Average power is energy transferred divided by the time in which it's transferred. So we rearrange our equation and substitute our numbers, giving us our working mark. And then calculating the correct answer with unit gives us our second 
In practice, it takes much longer to increase the temperature of the gas by 550 degrees C. Suggest one reason for this. Well, it's because we're going to be losing thermal energy to the surroundings. So the gas molecules are gaining kinetic energy at a lower rate, which is going to give us a lower rate of temperature change. OK, so when the temperature of the gas is increased by 550 degrees C, its pressure is 2.9 times 10 to the 5 pascals. So it's now about three times atmospheric pressure. The catch is then released, allowing the piston to move. As the piston moves, the temperature of the gas remains constant. OK, so state and explain what is happening to the piston. So again, we're going to say what happens and why it happens. So the what's going on here is that the pressure inside the piston is greater than the pressure outside or atmospheric pressure. So there's a resultant pressure there and it acts to accelerate the piston to the right. So if you look at the diagram, the piston's going to move out to the right. So this is our like our state part of it there. And then this part at the top is explaining why there's a resultant pressure or there's a resultant force, something along those lines. That tells us why we get the acceleration there. And that's going to get us our second marking point in there, saying why. Determine the volume of the gas when the piston stops moving. Well, the key piece of information is the fact it tells you temperature remains constant. And that tells us we can use Boyle's law to solve this problem. Um, so that's what I'm exactly what I'm going to do. So the form of Boyle's law we're going to use here, we're essentially using pressure times volume is a constant or pressure and volume are inversely proportional. We want to know what the volume is after the expansion. So we want to know what V2 is. Before it started expanding, it was at a pressure of 2.9 times 10 to the 5. Once it's finished expanding, it will be at atmospheric pressure. So it will now be at 1 times 10 to the 5. Its volume at the start was 1.9 times 10 to the 4. We were told that right back at the start. And we get what our volume is. You'll notice I haven't put the times 10 to the 5s in because there's one on top and bottom line. So it's redundant. And as usual, we've got our working mark for showing where our numbers come from and our mark for correct volume with unit. In both boiling and evaporation, a liquid changes into a gas. State two ways in which boiling differs from evaporation. Well, I can think of four, so I'm going to show you all of them, but we only needed two for this question. So first one, uh, boiling only occurs at the boiling point or the boiling temperature. Evaporation can occur below that boiling point. Uh, boiling is a constant temperature process. So when you're heating a material and it's boiling, say it's water, it will stay at 100 degrees the whole time until it's all turned into a gas. Evaporation causes the liquid to cool down because it's a completely different process, the escape of the high energy particles. So those those gives us two, but there are we're going to show you those with you too. So boiling requires energy to be input. So I have to be, I don't know, heating our liquid to get it to boil, like with a kettle or a saucepan or whatever it is. Evaporation just happens without any input in energy. So if I leave a container of water sitting out, it will have evaporation occurring even though I'm not supplying any energy. Evaporation also only occurs on the surface. So it's only the, the high energy molecules on the surface that can escape. Boiling, the molecules can be changing state anywhere in the liquid. So those are the four ones that we could essentially go for there. Before injecting a patient, a doctor wipes a small amount of volatile liquid onto a patient's skin. Explain in terms of the molecules how this procedure cools down the patient's skin. And you'll note down here at the bottom, this is a four mark question. So we're going to need to be giving quite an in-depth explanation of what's happening. So let's first of all talk about what process is occurring that is cooling them. So it's evaporation. So during evaporation, it's the highest energy molecules escape from the surface. So our first marking point there is just going to be for saying what's going on and giving more detail about it. So this causes the liquid's average kinetic energy to decrease. So if your highest energy particles are escaping, the average kinetic energy is going to decrease for the liquid that's left behind. And what that means is the liquid temperature drops 
because you should know that these two things are related to one another. So temperature is essentially a measure of the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So our final point that we need to do is explain how this procedure calls the patient's skin. Because at the moment, it's just that liquid that's evaporated. We haven't talked about the patient's skin yet. So the final step is that heat is conducted from the patient's skin to the cooler water cooling the skin. Um, actually, I should be a bit careful there. Uh, it's actually isn't say it's water, it just says it's liquid, so let's not call it water. The heat is conducted from the patient's skin to the cool water, and that's what schools the skin down. So it's actually the conduction that cools the actual patient's skin, but it's evaporation that causes that liquid to be cooler than the skin so that conduction occurs. So gases can be compressed, but liquids are incompressible. Explain in terms of molecules why liquids are incompressible. So the first point is fairly straightforward. In liquids, the atoms are touching and therefore there's no space to compress into. And then in terms of giving the second mark, so that's giving us our first mark in here. So the second mark is for explaining what would happen if we did try to compress them. So if you did try, there's going to be a large repulsive intermolecular force because you're essentially, they're touching each other, they can't go inside each other, they're both surrounded by electrons, so essentially there's a really big repulsive intermolecular force between them, and that gives you a second mark in there. So green light, a frequency 5.7 times 10 to the 14 hertz, is travelling in air at a speed of 3 times 10 to the 8. Uh, the light is incident on the surface of a transparent solid. The diagram shows the wave fronts and the direction of travel of the light in air. So we've got our ray of light, if you like, here, and you've got the wave fronts being shown that are already labelled. So in terms of drawing this diagram, let's see what that looks like. So as soon as the wave front meets the solid, they're going to travel slower in that material. So they're going to lag behind the rest of the wave front that hasn't crossed the boundary. And the longer that they've been traveling in the solid, the more they will lag behind the wave front in the air. OK, so what I'm going to do in my explanation is I'm going to be referring to the different ends of the wave front. So I've labeled them A and B, and then we can essentially differentiate between those two ends in our explanation. But so we can see here we've got a change in direction of the wavefront caused by crossing the boundary. And now we have to explain that. So in terms of explaining it, I'm going to referring to A and B, which I just drew on my diagram. So the end of the wavefront A hits the boundary before B, and that's going to be our kind of first marking point, identifying that, that is the case. So the waves are going to slow down after crossing the boundary, um, but A spends longer in the slower material. And that's kind of our second key point. A spends long, the longest in the slower material, and so it is furthest behind the wave front. And so the difference in time in the slower substance is what causes the wave front to change direction. And that's our last point, identifying we've got the direction change due to this difference in time in the slower substance there. The refractive index of the transparent solid is 1.3. The light is incident on the surface of the solid at an angle of incidence of 67. Calculate the angle of refraction of light in the solid. So I'm going to show you two different approaches to this, depending on how you've been taught how to use Snell's law. So the basic version, which you may have been taught, is this one where we say we've got the refractive index and we are going from a low refra refractive index to a high. So I is going to be bigger than R. So we're going to do sine I over sine R. We're going to rearrange to make sine R the subject, calculate what it is, and then do the inverse sine of that to get our angle of refraction. So again, as usual, we've got a working mark and a final answer mark. The other way you may have been taught how to do this is using the full version of Snell's law, which looks like this. So N1, the refractive index of the material before the boundary. N2, the refractive index of the material after the boundary. In this case, N equals 1. Why? Because it's, because it's air. 
And then we've got Sinai and Sinar. The advantage of this one on the right hand side is you don't have to spend any time thinking about wh which one's bigger, I and R, so you can put them in the right place. It's the same every time. So again, we're going to make sine R the subject of this. And again, I've missed out the little two. And then plug our numbers in. And we'll notice at this point, it turns out the same. So both of these would get you your working mark. And then you get your final answer of 45 degrees. Again, answer with unit gets you the second mark. And it doesn't matter which of these two methods you use. They are both perfectly valid. I tend to use this one on the right hand side because then I don't need to spend any time thinking about which one should be on the top line, which one should be on the bottom line, like on the one on the left, but it really doesn't matter. Determine the wavelength of the green light in the transparent solid. So the first thing we need to do is work out what the speed of it is, remembering that during refraction, uh, we get the wave slowing down, and we can use the refractive index to find out by how much it's slowed down. It's slowed down by a factor of 1.3. So we've got the speed of the green light in the solid. And now we can use the wave equation in order to solve what the wavelength is. So um, again, fairly standard here. We've got some working marks appearing over here. And we've got some working marks appearing again, and we get our final answer with the units. So there's a lot of marks available for this question. Lots of people forgot to do this stage on the left-hand side, though. They put 3 times 10 to the 8 in for the speed in the equation, which was incorrect, because that's not how fast it's travelling in the solid. The diagram shows a circuit diagram that includes component X. So looking at the diagram, here's our component X. So the name... State the name of the component X. Well, that is a thermistor. Uh, lots of people write in stuff like variable resistor. You do have to know all your circuit symbols. A variable resistor, which quite a few people put, looks like this, which I've just drawn on the, up here on the top right. It's an arrow through resistor. So something you just need to know all the different circuit symbols. So now what we're going to do is going to be um, comparing the or getting expressions for the potential difference across these components. So what we'll find is X and the 30 ohm resistor are in parallel. So their potential difference, if we plug the voltmeter in, should be the same. And the potential difference across X plus the potential difference across 20 should be equal to the potential difference across our power source. Those are essentially what we're going to be. So that's what we can see here. The potential difference X or across the thermistor is going to be equal to the potential difference across the 30 ohm resistor and the vx is going to be the potential difference across our power source minus the potential difference across the uh, 20 ohm resistor so the emf of the battery is 6 volts and the resistance of the component x is 15 ohms calculate the total resistance of the circuit so to do this, this is a two-stage process. We're going to get the resistance of the parallel section, and then we're going to add it to the resistance of the 20 ohm resistor. So the parallel section, we're going to use our parallel resistor rule. So we're told that the resistance of component X is 15 degrees, degrees, ohms. So we apply our 1 over rule. So 1 over R is 0 0.1 which means R is equal to 10 ohms. And then we're going to add it to the 20 ohm resistor to get 30 ohms. Calculate the ammeter reading. Well, we've been told the EMF of our battery is 6 volts. So we can use V equals IR. We know what the EMF of our supply is. We know what the total resistance of our circuit is, 30. So we can divide those and it gets us our current. And again, there's a working mark and there's an answer mark. I uh, realised in the first question I forgot to uh, show what I'm doing. So we've got our working with our parallel resistor, got our working with a series one, and we've got our final answer with correct unit. The temperature of component X increases. State and explain what happens to the ammeter reading. The ammeter reading is controlled by the total circuit resistance, as essentially we've just used in our calculation. So for me, the resistance of the thermistor is going to decrease, so there's going to be a mark for identifying that, that when you heat a thermistor, its resistance decreases. So that causes total circuit resistance to decrease as well, and that's going to 
increase the current because potential difference increases. So we are going to need all of this at the end to essentially ex do the explaining part. So the first mark here that we're doing, essentially we're just stating it. And this second one, we are doing the explaining. A student turns the handle of an alternating current generator and the coil rotates. And then we've got it connected via some slip rings so we can measure the output. OK, so here we can see the structure. So we've got this coil, which is free to rotate in the middle inside a magnetic field. We've got a handle that's going to allow someone to actually spin it. And we've got some slip rings to allow us to connect it to something to measure the output there. OK, so. Um, we've the thing I'm going to draw in here is the field. So a field, remember, the magnetic field goes from north to south. So I've just drawn that on the diagram so we can see where that's going. So there's an alternating voltage output between the two terminals. Explain why rotating the coil produces an output voltage. So um, this is an induction question because we've got a conductor cutting through a magnetic field. So here is uh, the all three marks, so it's very simple. So you have to identify that we've got a conductor cutting cutting through. So there's our first mark. What it's cutting through, it's cutting through a magnetic field. And then what's the effect of that? It induces an EMF or induces a voltage in the coils there. So very short, simple statement, but it explains why we get an output voltage. State the position of the rotating coil when the alternating output voltage is at a maximum value and why the maximum output occurs at this position. I think some diagrams will be helpful here. So in it, the position it's currently in, it's so this is your coil going across here and there's a wire going into the page and there's a wire going into the page here as well. So the important wire, the one going into the page, is moving in an upwards direction here. And the one going into the page here is moving downwards here. And you'll notice they are traveling perpendicular to the field. And so, so they're cutting the maximum number of flux lines per second. If we rotate it, so here is where your coil is. There's a wire going into the page at the top and there's a wire going into the page at the bottom. So that wire at the top is now going across to the right. So it's going parallel to the field. The one at the bottom is going to the left. So it's going parallel to the field. If they're going to the parallel to the field. They're not cutting through any of our flux lines. So we're not going to induce an EMF or a voltage there. So you can see the one where it's horizontal is where we're going to get the maximum. So that's what we're going to put in as our so we're going to put horizontal or in its current position. That's our stating the position. And then the conductor is moving perpendicular to the field. And so the most flux lines are cut per second. That's our second part. And we've explained why the maximum occurs at this position. A lamp and an open switch are connected in series to the output terminals of the generator. The switch is closed and the light and the lamp lights up. The student has to apply a greater force on the handle to rotate the generator now that we've plugged in the ball. Explain why we need a bigger force. So there are two ways of explaining this and either of them that is fine. There's one we can explain it in terms of energy and there's the other we can explain it in terms of Lenz's law. So I'm going to show you both. So I think the more straightforward way of explaining this is the student must input more energy to also power the bowl. OK, so if we're now powering a bulb, which we weren't before, we're going to have to input more energy. So they must do more work. And then the final point is, well, we go work is force times distance. We haven't changed the distance that they apply a force. So they must have to apply a larger force to do more work. And that gets us three of our marks there. Identifying we must supply more energy, they must do more work, so we have to apply a larger force because we haven't changed the distance that they're applying the force. Explain this in terms of Lenz's law. So uh, we saw this in the multiple choice that something came up about this. So a current is now flowing in the conductor. Because if we plugged in a light bulb, if our light bulb switches on, there must be a current. And that current produces a magnetic field which in which essentially interacts with the external magnetic field to resist the motion. That's what Lenz's law 
tells us there. And then, therefore, the student must increase their force to overcome their additional resistive force. So uh, I think I've got to say, so there'll be a mark in here for identifying there's now a current flowing in the conductor, if our light bulb is going to switch on. The magnetic field from that current interacts with the external field from the magnets that we applied to resist the motion. And we know it resists the motion because of Lenz's law. So essentially, these two things are staying the same. And if there's a bigger resistive force, they must have to apply a bigger force to overcome that resistive force. That's our third and final part of the three marks there. So final question looking at uh, the gold foil alpha scattering experiment. So we've got a beam of alpha particles incident on a gold sheet, and we're detecting what happens to those alpha particles once they have interacted or not interacted with that gold sheet. Uh, so we're going to state and explain what can be deduced from the following observations. So the majority of alpha particles pass through the gold sheet undeflected and are detected on the far side. So first of all, deduction, what does that tell us? Um, well, essentially, that one is this one here at the bottom. So it is the ones that haven't gone anywhere near to this nucleus at the top here. So they're a long distance away from the nucleus. So they have not experienced a force and they just keep going straight on. So in terms of what they tell us, we'll explore that in a second. The second deduction is going to be, we're going to be talking about the second one down. And the third deduction, we're looking at this one at the top. Um, but we'll come back to that in a second. First one. What is our deduction? The nuclei must be very small. There must be a large distance between the nuclei or most of the atom is empty space. Anything like that would be the correct deduction here. And in terms of explaining that, it's because the majority of our particles have experienced no force and must have not gone near to a nucleus. So if most of them have done that, most of them must not have interacted with the nucleus. So the nuclei must be very small or there's a lot of empty space. That's our conclusion. So a small number of alpha particles are deflected as they pass through the gold sheet. So the deduction is the nucleus must be charged. The reason being alpha particles are charged. So to exert an electric force on them, the nucleus must also be charged. Um, to exert an electric force, both objects have to be charged. Okay, So that's deduction and the explanation. A very small number of alpha particles are deflected through very large angles or return back the way they came. So this is actually jumping into some momentum and collisions topic here, because the is that the nuclear mass must be very small, because if the nuclear mass was very small, then what would happen is the alpha particle would keep going in the same direction and the nucleus would get sent in that direction as well, if they were similar in size. If the nuclear mass was much larger than the alpha, what happens is the alpha just bounces off and the nucleus is barely affected by it or has a very, very small recoil there. So the fact that some alpha particles are bounced back shows us we're looking at this one at the bottom. So whereas if the alpha had kept, they'd all kept going in the same direction, we'd have said it's more like the scenario at the top. So what does that tell us? Well, the final deduction is the nucleus is much more massive than the alpha particle, or the mass is concentrated in the nucleus, something along those lines. And so and the explanation is in order for the alpha particle to rebound, it must collide with a much more massive particle or much more massive nucleus. And that gets us our second mark there. Final part. So a beam consists of both, both alpha particles and beta particles pass through a region of space where there is a magnetic field perpendicular to the direction of the beam. State two ways in which the deflection of alpha particles differs from that of beta. So alpha particles are positive, beta are negative, so they would be affected by the magnetic field in opposite directions. So let's say alpha went to the left, beta would go to the right. And there was actually a question about this in the multiple choice paper as well. The other thing is that alpha is much more massive and so we'll experience a much smaller deflection because uh, even though alpha experiences double the force that beta does, it's like 10,000 times the mass. So it's going to have a much smaller deflection due to its much larger mass. OK, so 
Um, we'll take a look at the threshold table and the examiner's report for this paper as well. So what we're looking at here is component uh, 4.1. So the thing to notice straight away is how low the 9 threshold is. So it's not far above half marks here. And as a consequence, you'll notice that these scores are all in the top range, are all very bunched up. So there's only a three mark difference between 8 and 9, and only four between 8 and 7. So these are all really bunched up here. And the lowness of this score should indicate to you that this was a pretty challenging paper um, in terms of uh, completing it. But, but having done the paper, I'm sure you were aware of that. Um, Let's actually have a look at the examiner's report for this paper as So some key take home mes messages from the examiners. So a lot of comment on here about um, people not taking the exact instructions from questions where it's given you guidance in terms of answering a question and the answers were often quite vague in terms of them. Um, there's a lot of comment about how to do calculations. So um, at, when we do this, we teach the uh, South method. So equation rearranged, substituting in the numbers, answer to appropriate number seven figures and with a unit. And you'll see the examiner's report is highlighting the people using that uh, were generally doing uh, doing much better and actually commenting on the amount of significant figures that you give your answers to as along with units as well. Um, and the thing it says here at the bottom, um, candidates should be aware that they will be required to apply their knowledge of physics to unfamiliar situations. Um, this is, I think, tells you the crux about what physics is. This is not a regurgitation subject. It's not about just memorizing a set of notes that you can spill onto paper. You're expected to be able to use the laws that you've learned and some reasoning ability and some thought to apply them to something you've never seen before. Um, so bear that in mind. When you're doing physics, you shouldn't expect to know how something instantly applies to something else. You're expected to think about it. Um, but yeah, and it concludes by saying if they felt that candidates did not read the questions carefully and wrote standard known facts instead of actually answering the question, which sort of ties into what I was just saying. So these are the general take home messages. We can also look at them on a specific question by question basis. So it'll probably be helpful if you open up to the specific questions when we're going through these. So uh, the first one you would give about the acceleration graph and you were doing the speed time graph. Um, uh, yeah, anyway, so then we, in terms of sketching the graph, uh, you, a lot of people simply copied the previous graph, which is interesting. Um, but it says, generally speaking, stronger candidates had no problem with this one at all. And then next one uh, was about stating what the principle of conservation of momentum was. And it's saying a lot of people answered in terms of energy, not in terms of momentum. So it's just about knowing what conservation of momentum is and when you're allowed to apply it. Um, and then again, the final part explaining how the rocket accelerates says only the strongest ca candidates answered this question correctly and then, and then gave an answer there. So for that, that was quite a good discriminator for who some of the best candidates were. Question two um, was where they were doing like the center of mass and the balancing question. Um, generally speaking, calculating weight is fine. That's a fairly simple question. Um, but uh, lots of people, I think, got the distance wrong in their calculation. So I saw lots of answers as I was marking with people who had taken the wrong distance in their calculation, even though they knew the correct equation. Um, with the definition of center of mass, again, this is just a thing you have to know. There are some definitions you need to know, and this is one of them. Uh, so you can see this was kind of a either you knew it or you didn't question. Um, people on the next part not knowing their or not rearranging their moment equation correctly. Um, again, uh, something about learning to rearrange equations, making sure you're clear on how that works would help you with that one. Um, 
And then it's saying for the next one, for an explain type question, it says most answers or a lot of answers weren't given full credit uh, for not giving a detailed and clear enough question. So not really answering the question that was given as it kind of referenced in the general stuff. So question three. Um, this is where we had the cube floating in the liquid. Um, there was talking about why there was a pressure on the surface due to the collisions of particles with that top surface. Again, a calculation question. Most people get the correct answer, so that's all fine. Um, and then, uh, as I said, when I was going through it, a lot of people, when they were they got pressure and they were trying to turn it into a force, um, they didn't put the correct value for the area in, so there were lots of mistakes made with getting the area in there. Uh, calculating work done, people choosing the wrong distance, but generally speaking, knew the right equation. Um, and then saying, in terms of suggesting sources of inefficiency, it's saying that's where the stronger candidates differentiate themselves by suggesting why more energy might be required than uh, it could be. And then question number four, when we were starting to look at energy and power. Um, so uh, the one I want to highlight is down here at part two. So people suggest saying too vague stuff like heat is lost instead of saying specifically for that question how heat was lost, saying it was being transferred by a specific medium. This is something that actually crops up quite a lot. People being too vague in saying just heat is lost instead of saying what is causing that heat to be lost. Okay, um, and then in terms of um, explaining what happens to the piston once you increase the pressure inside, I saw loads of these saying the piston moves upwards and that's not clear enough. Like it, if you actually look at the diagram, it certainly doesn't move upwards. So being clear that the piston is gonna move to the right, so saying what's actually gonna happen um, and thinking about what someone who's reading it is going to interpret from your answer. And then again, as um, as is quite often the case um, in questions, most of the time people will identify the correct equation to use it, um, but they won't have uh, done sufficient practice handling that equation and will make incorrect substitutions or incorrect rearrangements, that kind of thing. Question five, this was the one about comparing like boiling and evaporation. Um, so I think one of the things it says in here, so it says candidates should be advised to supply only the number of answers requested, um, because the, if you give another answer and it contradicts something you've already said, that can end up um, having that original mark taken away because you've actually said something contradictory and it's not actually going to lead to any extra credit. So if it asks for two things, give two things giving three or four things can actually start leading you into trouble. Um, then talking about the mechanism for evaporation, um, as I was saying at the time, that was a four mark question and lots of issues there with people just not giving enough detail to justify giving them four marks. So something to be reflecting on as you're going through a paper, have I actually written four key points that are gonna get me four key marks? And then final one, uh, why liquids are incompressible. Um, most people talked about the spacing, um, but um, didn't talk about the fact that there would be a force resisting you trying to compress them. Moving on to the waves and the refraction question. Uh, so it's suggesting that people who did better tended to draw on the diagram, uh, whereas people who just tried to explain it without annotating the diagram um, didn't do as well. Um, calculation of the angle of refraction was generally correct, so most people applied Snell's law of refraction correctly. Uh, nice to see. Um, and then for the final one, where you're calculating the speed in the glass, it's saying it was best approached in two stages, so calculating the speed and then calculating the wavelength, um, rather than trying to do everything in one go or skipping the first stage. Okay, so then moving on to electricity. Generally speaking, people knew it was a uh, thermistor, but occasionally people said it was a variable resistor, which I highlighted at the time I was going through it. Um, when you were giving expressions for Vx, the question asked for equations. So um, 
that you should exp answer in the form of an equation. And it was uh, also saying you saw a lot of this expression here, which is uh, something I saw quite a few times. People not appreciating that Vx and V30 are in parallel. So then we'd only have a, have one of those in the expression. Then uh, in terms of how changing the, oh, sorry, first calculating the total resistance of the circuit, um, people forgetting to uh, flip their resistance back over with parallel resistors. Um, that's something that comes up quite a lot. Uh, but other than that, most people are fine with that. And then in terms of explaining how temperature affects the current, saying most people knew what was going on, but didn't give sufficient detail to get a full credit for their answer. So again, this common theme, not giving enough detail in answering questions. Okay, question eight on magnetic fields, um, explaining why there's an output voltage. So for the first one saying most full credit was often awarded here. This is a classic question that you get time and time and time again with electromagnetic induction. You've got a conductor cutting through a field, inducing an EMF. Those are the three things that you need almost all the time with those kind of questions. Uh, in terms of the position of the rotor, um, so again, people being vague and not describing what they were trying to say in a detailed way. And then in terms of explaining why, um, Uh, people saying that more flux was cut instead of saying more flux was cut per second. So not giving sufficiently detail because it's the rate of flux cutting that determines your EMF. And that's important. And then the final one, what happens when you connect a bulb? So it's just saying this was a really big differentiator between people who did well and people who didn't. People were appreciating we're going to have to supply more energy. So you have to do more work and therefore you need a bigger force. Uh, that was quite good discriminator. Okay, so final question on nuclear physics. Um, part one, explaining why most of them are unaffected. Um, so the, the part that people uh, struggled with there is actually explaining how the evidence led to the correct deduction. So most people knew what the correct deduction was, but couldn't explain why that evidence led to it, as in that it hadn't traveled anywhere near a nucleus. Second one, um, lots of people just writing the same answer to part one. Um, just uh, in terms of thinking logically about it, you're not going to be given credit for the saying the same thing twice. So at least write something different, even if you're not sure about what you're doing. Um, and then people in part three, again, being vague, they're not talking about the alpha and the nucleus. They were just uh, not being clear in what they were describing there. And then the final one, uh, where it was looking at the differences between alpha and beta, lots of people not answering the question. It asked you how they would be different in a magnetic field in a vacuum. So anything to do with penetration doesn't apply because it's a vacuum. So there's nothing to stop them traveling. Or oh, the ionizing ability, again, not appropriate for the question. We're looking for the stuff in the going opposite directions and the size of their deflection there.